um, you're all here. So uh, we're going to, uh, to make a start. Um, and we have started uh, recording. So do have a look at that first slide. It, it tells you that chat is really for general points and information. And Q&A is to ask questions of the panelists. But participants can also answer those questions. Anyway, welcome to this Southwest Green Ecosystems webinar. Today, we'll hear about the highlights, lowlights, and trends in marine and coastal birds in the Southwest. So thank you to Alex Banks, Mark Grantham, Ruth Porter, and Paul St. Pierre uh, for coming along to uh, give their separate presentations. And uh, we'll start off with uh, Alex um, with regard to some very interesting work which has been um, done on Lundy. So I'm going to stop screen sharing and Alex will start his. Uh, it's actually over to Paul first, Keith. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry, yeah. Paul. Right. It is, you're quite right. It's over to Paul <laughs> first. It's on my list. So hi, everyone. My name's Paul St. Pierre. I'm Conservation Officer for the RSPB. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. I'm just going to start this presentation. So, yeah, I'm Paul St. Pierre, RSPB Conservation Officer based in the southwest of England, leading in our marine work. And I'm going to be talking about Lundy. So in 2021, 40 years after the initial uh, 1981 census, RSPB staff and volunteers returned to Lundy to reassess the numbers and distribution of the cliff nesting seabirds. This presentation provides an update on the changes of cliff nesting and gulls on Lundy and highlights the importance of this island for seabirds in England now. Uh, I'd just like to thank the Landmark Trust who hosted this and supported this survey through the provision of transport accommodation and also some of their volunteers helped out. So hopefully you all know where Lundy is. It's an island that sits in the Bristol Channel on the edge of the Celtic Sea. So that's a map. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background to Lundy. So um, it's 17 kilometers off the North Devon coast. It rises to about 140 meters above sea level. So it's got some very dramatic cliffs. It's about 500 hectares various designations. Um, it's owned by the National Trust and run by the Landmark Trust to look after its cultural um, built heritage and also its natural heritage. And it's run as a, a tourism destination as well. In terms of its birds, so uh, the first real bit of information we know about the birds was Perry 1939, when he uh, estimated 80,000 birds on Lundy, which is a, a amazing number of birds. So clearly a really big seabird colony. Um, there's about 10 birds, 10 species of, of breeding seabird on Lundy currently. Uh, the last national seabird census in 2000 found about 6,000 birds. So that's a really small amount compared to what Perry found. Um, one of the major pieces of conservation work for seabirds was carried out in 2004, and this was an island, island restoration project. And uh, the, the islands were cleared of rats, and they were rat free, uh, have been rat free since 2004. And there's been significant increases in the seabird population since then. Uh, so a census, uh, a, 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 the, the census we're carrying out has been uh, carried out on a four yearly cycle. And the last one was in 2017 and 18. And that reported 17, uh, 21,000 seabirds on Monday, which is an amazing response to the work that's been carried out. So to give you a bit of an idea of the methodology, um, six people visited the island between the 1st and 10th of June to carry out the survey. The species involved were guillemot, razorbill, puffin, kittiwake, former shag, uh, lesser, and three species of, of laris gull. Um, all the survey methodology followed that, uh, which is a standard methodology for surveying those species, which is set out in Walsh et al. 1995. And just to say that all the data we collect goes onto the JNCC SMP database, which is really important because this is feeding into the national, the next national um, census for seabirds. So. Yeah, that's really important to make sure it's all collated in the right place. A couple of things to point out about the methodology is that it has some limitations. So it does not always necessarily allow you to give an overall count for some species. So for example, puffin can spend quite a lot of time in burrows, et cetera. So you don't always get an idea of the, the true number, but what it does allow you is to present trends. Um, and also the survey timing is not ideal for large gulls or shag. So that would be better earlier on in the season, but this is mainly, because the, the survey is targeted around the birds that are commonest here, uh, which are the orcs. So it's optimum for them. 
In terms of the way that we carry out the survey, uh, each section of cliff, uh, coastal cliff was monitored from the same vantage point. And as you can see on the map, it's broken up uh, into a range of sections. Um, and all this information is stored on a site register, which has really been really useful to enable us to return to exactly the same spots and count the birds uh, uh, systematically. Um, during the 2021 season, the, the weather was favourable, which allowed us to complete at least two visits to the busier colonies around Jenny's Cove and further north on the west coast in sections E, F and G. So in, in those cases, we just took the higher recorded figure uh, for those sections. So in terms of results, this is an overview of the species totals and trends. Um, so the green is a positive and the red is negative. Uh, species are listed down the side and um, I've set out in the table against the, the previous national survey in 2000. And then we've got the last survey, 2017, uh, and then this survey. Um, and then we've got the percentage changes and I've got a column at the end, which I pulled off the JNCC website looking at the national trend and as you can see some birds are doing really well um, um, and, and, and they're following a national trend but doing even better so the, the three species of orc are the two species at the top in particular they're kind of following the national trend but doing a lot better than you'd find it elsewhere and then you've got three species the kitty wake former and shag which are right, again positive um, but in, in the case of kitty wake and shag well, in case of all three species, they're actually going against the national trend, which is decline. So again, that's a, a quite a positive thing. Um, and then you've got uh, the three large gulls, which um, are really pretty much following what's happening nationally. So the overall population is 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 following that trend, and it's and it's declining. So, so yeah, it's a quite an interesting situation here, where some of it's what you might expect and others are, are actually much more positive than you'd find elsewhere. So, so there we go. That's the overall. And I just wanted to run through um, the species, just give a little bit of background and, and run through the trends over time through the different surveys. So this is Guillemot and Razorbill. Um, and Guillemots are, and so on the slide, you've got uh, all the different surveys carried out. Um, since 1981, um, and the, the, the black bar is Guillemot and the grayer one is Razorbill. And we've got a, an arrow which indicates when the rats were removed from Lundy. I've also popped in at the top um, the counts that Perry had in 1939 for both the species. So on the left is Guillemot, on the right is Razorbill. Um, and you can see that well, Guillemot is the second most numerous seabird species breeding on Lundy. That's after Manxia water. And we found an estimated 9,888 individuals in 2021. This is a 60% increase on the 2017 figure. So it, it looks like this almost exponential growth on Lundy, which is absolutely amazing. Um, that's about 10,000 birds. That's sort of almost half of what Perry found. So clearly there's lots more space for them. And, you know, you never know, in the next 10 years, we might find that the population is, um, you know, if we go back and survey the next 10 years, it might be creeping towards that figure. It's also worth noting that Nundi now supports almost four times the number of guillemots recorded in 2004, uh, and the population is currently at the, a level not seen since the late 1940s. So moving to Razorbill, they're the most widely distributed cliff nesting seabird on Nundi, occupying all sections, and they've also increased dramatically since 2004, and we found 3,533 individuals in 2021, and this is a 104% increase on the previous, uh, previous survey. So yeah, some really positive news for these two species. They're, they're increasing very rapidly. So yeah, Puffin, a really important cultural bird on Lundy. It is, uh, Lundy is Norse for Puffin. So really there's some really strong links there and a bird that's gone through quite a, a dramatic change on Lundy over the last few years. So here's the graph of all the surveys. Uh, and again, you can see the arrow where erratic eradication was carried out. And I think the continued growth in puffin numbers since 2004, when there was just five birds uh, to, to, to 848 individuals in 2021 is extremely stark uh, and an incredible uh, change around in fortunes. And if you actually look at the study plots uh, that the conservation team on the Landmark Trust um, um, data, if you look at that data and extrapolate it across our, our, our figures, you'd probably find that the puffin numbers are double what they are now. So, Again, you know, if you look at the Perry figure of 3,500, there's still obviously lots more habitat available for them, but the population is moving in the, back towards that direction. So yeah, really, really encouraging and positive sign. 
So next species is kitty wake. Um, and this is a red list, 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 red listed species that we are really worried about nationally and it's undergone massive declines. Um, in terms of Lundy, here's the data that we've got from the first survey in 1981, and it kind of follows those national trends. But interestingly, um, that trend changes from 2013 onwards, and that upturn in 2017 has continued into 2021, and we've got a 19% increase. And the, the figure we've got of 284 apparently occupied nests is now restoring the populations to its pre-2000 levels. So really good signs, but I think we need to look at this, uh, uh, obviously monitor this population and continue to look at it over time to see whether this continues into the future. Former, um, another bird that breeds on Lundy, colonised much of the UK in the, the, the early 1900s, uh, breeds pretty much around the whole coast of Lundy. Um, here's a map of the trends. Um, what we find the 2021 survey produced an encouraging further increase in formers to 265 apparently occupied sites. And this is the highest count over the 40 years of the survey. There's a couple of lines in there which indicate a couple of really important areas for um, former on Monday, Jenny's Cove and Gannett Rock. And they support pretty much almost 50% of the population of former. So even though they're spread quite widely, there is still some really important specific locations for them. Moving on to shag, another red listed species that we are really concerned about. Uh, Lundy's not the most important site in the southwest, but it, um, it's really good to get monitoring of, of, of all the seabirds at any of the seabird colonies, really, so we can get some really useful trend data. And here is the, the data we've got since 1981. So as I've said before, the timing of seabird surveys on Lundy um, are past the peak period for breeding shags. So consequently, consequently, we need to treat the results with some caution. However, the 96 apparently occupied nests in 2021 is a welcome increase over the 2017 figure of just 55 and much closer to the survey in 2013. So, yeah, so it must have been a, a pretty good year uh, this year for them uh, in 2021. So moving on to the three uh, large gull species, we've got lesser blackback, greater blackback and herring gull uh, that breed on Lundy. And I've uh, put all those um, all their data together into one graph um, across the surveys since 2000. Um, so the current time of the survey is not optimal for sensing breeding girls and some pairs may have abandoned sites by the time the survey is carried out. So again, we've got to apply some caution, but the future for, for these large girls on Lundy is uncertain. The overall trend for girls is downwards, but the outlook for lesser blackback girls looking particularly bleak and the great blackback girls are at their lowest level since 1996. However, herring gulls have shown a slight upturn and hopefully future surveys will seek to determine if this is the start of a more positive trend. So because the gulls are not well surveyed, we're planning to carry out a survey this year in May um, to give us a better idea of the current status of the large gulls. Moving on in terms of the islands and the distribution of cliff nesters. So the survey found that over 90% of the cliff nesting birds are found on the west side of the island between Jenny's Cove and the Northwest Point. So sections E, F and G. This concentration on the West Coast was, was always been the case. And even back in 1939, this is something that um, Perry noticed as well. And it's important to note that Jenny's Cove still remains the most important site on the island. Uh, and it, it supports between 40 and 50% of the island's seabirds, so of cliff nesting seabirds. And it now looks and sounds like a true seabird, seabird city. So yeah, so it's um, give you a bit of an idea. This is Jenny's Cove. Um, and you can, might see some white um, marks on the cliffs. And this is where a lot of the seabirds are breeding. And if you look at the, the picture on the left, that's just um, one side of one of the gullies that's, that's pretty much below some of the pinnacles in the center of the picture. And that, that, that one side of that gully has a thousand guillemots alone. So absolutely phenomenal. Um, and if you've got a telescope, yeah, it, it, it sort of really picks out the birds and makes you realize how many birds are actually there. So that was the species. And this is really looking at the overall seabird assemblage trend since uh, 1982. And as you can see, the seabirds were pretty stable or pretty static up, up until about 2004. Uh, and then there's been a sudden a dramatic increase. Um, there's, there's a couple of um, columns on the graph. One of them looks at the, all the species, so that includes the barrow nesters, particularly the Manx shearwater, and the other one is the cliff nesting species. 
So as you can see, the population now is starting to regularly exceed 20,000 birds, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Also means it signifies that the site potentially quite well, qualifies as internationally important as, as a seabird uh, location. So, uh, and again, if you look at figures across England, there's probably only two other seabird SPAs that have more birds, uh, cliff nesting seabirds on them, and they're both in the Northeast. So again, it shows how important Lundy really is uh, in an England context. So just a bit quick summary on some of the changes that might be affecting Lundy. So I think there's some positive forces around. And if you look at the top left-hand side, that's a puffin chick. And post uh, rat eradication, uh, the first recorded puffin for 30 years were found in 2005. Um, so clearly the rat eradication and the ongoing biosecurity work is really, really important. It's also really important to note that uh, food availability we are really important uh, plays a really important role in, in our seabird populations as well. And we know that the seas around Lundy are important for the sand eel stocks and for other species as well. And, but what we don't know is, is what role they're taking really and, and whether they're a causal factor, what the trends are. And, and there's things like the Travos box, which is, it has fishery management measures, which again, may be playing a role. So that'd be something that would be really worth further investigating. Clearly some negative effects. Um, we know that climate change might be affecting some of the species. So for example, foraging shag um, affected by storminess. And we know that food availability is affected through sea temperature changes or sea, sea temperature rises. So climate change is gonna be something that is gonna have a continuing impact to the colony here. Uh, there's other things like fisheries management and discards where we know that um, these might have impacts on, on scavenging seabirds like large gulls. And also up, up, and, up and coming and emerging threats, in particular floating wind. And we know that the west coast of the UK is now uh, the next in line for looking at whether the investigations in terms of floating wind, and there's a target for 4.4 gig of floating wind for the Celtic Sea. So we're going to start seeing dramatic development potential uh, for this area. And we want to make sure those are in the right place to protect our seabirds. So quick summary and looking forward. So absolutely amazing now, Lundy. As over 27,000 breeding seabirds. This is mainly orcs and Manx water. So that's an amazing turnaround since 2004. This does mask a, mask a grim future for the large gulls and further survey work is planned for this year. We're also planning a repeat survey for Manx water um, in 2023. And alongside that, we'll do some storm petrol surveys as well. Absolutely critical to the seabirds on Lundy is the ongoing biosecurity work. Um, and Finally, obviously now Lundy is supporting internationally important seabird populations. There's current green paper out. The government has put out a consultation recently, and this site currently is just a triple SI, and this is clearly a case for potentially for levelling up with, with, uh, as, as a site which really could benefit from, from much greater protection just to reflect its, its, uh, its sheer value for seabirds. So that's the end of the talk, and I'd just like to say thank you to everyone involved in the project. And I'd just like to mention particularly David Price and Peter Slader, who created this amazing data set. And we wouldn't be talking about the seabirds in Lundy in the same way without them. So yes, yeah, a big thank you to them and all the everyone else involved for their support. OK, thank you very much indeed, Paul, and thank you for, for keeping to time so well. Um, there's a couple of things that popped up in chat. I couldn't actually use Q&A for some reason. So if um, attendees are having trouble using Q&A, please use chat, but it might just be an artifact of um, me being the event moderator or something like that. Paul, can you see in chat a couple of questions there? Um, I'm just gonna have a look, see what I can see. Um, there's what we're gonna do, uh, attendees, is we're going to just, Put any yep. questions to Paul now, and then when Alex uh, starts the regional summaries going, we'll leave it until the end of those regional summaries before we address questions. So yeah, Paul. so I just picked up the chat. So where where are the puffins coming from that are colonising Lundy? So clearly, uh, puffins take a few years to actually become adults. So even if you removed the rats, they wouldn't be necessarily responding straight away. It would take a few years, maybe up to three to four years, before you'd actually start getting. Uh, those birds returning and boosting the population. Clearly, um, 
there are other drivers uh, and birds are colonizing, but we don't know where from, but the most likely locations are the Welsh colonies, I would say, but we don't have the data to tell us that. So if we had some tracking data, that would be really useful or, yeah, it would have to be colouring birds probably observed at colonies otherwise. Uh, and Paul, you can see my chat question, can you, which is about oil in the Bristol Channel during World War Two and the effect that must have had in terms of, you know, declining numbers of seabirds. Yes, yeah, so I, I can't see that, I'm afraid. So I don't know where it is. Ah. I, I've only got one chat and yeah, so I'm just not sure. <laughs> I, so, I, wonder, I wonder if that's an artifact of me being, you know, the moderator, <laughs> as it were. But the question was that um, the word from longtime Lundy residents who are now dead was that during the uh, World War Two, that the Bristol Channel was awash with oil. And that obviously had a very large effect on seabirds at sea. So mm. is there any evidence that you know of which indicates what the effect of that oil, that oil pollution might have been in terms of the decline in Lundy bird populations? It's, it's really hard to say. I think there are, um, I mean, I know David Price did a quite a thorough review of a lot of the information and has presented uh, the data on, on slides in the past. I mean, the Perry information is really helpful because it, it is a sort of, a systematic count if you like and it's a full count but um since then until 1981 we didn't really have that sort of information so there's a big gap in information really but clearly the, the two issues with, with with oil is that one that it will kill birds the other issue is that it will stop them breeding even if they survive so they actually become you know ecologically you know dead in some ways they just don't, don't breed effectively so clearly there would have been a long lasting and quite a damaging effect uh, potentially from oil but because the data is so thin, we don't really know what, what, what that situation is. But, but clearly, um, we've not had any oil pollution incidents of that scale or magnitude, um, you know, in the recent past. So, yeah, sorry, I can't really answer that question very well. OK, I've, I've got one question which has popped up here from Francis Rowney. Um, how many rats were there on Lundy um, before the eradication? I should know this. Do you know what it is, Paul? It's a very good question. And one of my colleagues uh, would have rolled it off her tongue very, very easily. Um, and I'm just trying to, yeah, I don't know. I can't answer that question, but we can certainly um, share the information if needs be. So with each of these eradications, you do do an estimate of the population of rats. So uh, we can um, we can certainly share that with people. Um, so if they want to, we can get back to them on that one, if you like. Uh, and Paul, I can do a little bit of um, asking around about that. I actually have a certificate of being an rat eradicator. I'm not sure I'm uh, entitled to that, but um, that's 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 a very interesting point. And the only other one on on Q and A that I can see, um, and nothing else popping up on chat. So uh, we'll say thank you very much for that. Um, and now, having answered, asked those questions, we're going to move on to Alex, who's going to start the regional summaries going and run through those before we actually come back to, um, to questions. So thank you again, Paul. And Alex, can you take over? Thank you very much, Keith. I will share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. So yeah, I'm going to kick off the regional roundup for the Southwest for 2021. So it predominantly focuses on the uh, seabird breeding season last summer. For the report, we're also interested in, in coastal birds as well. So um, one of the aims of these webinars is to encourage people to submit information. I'll be editing the uh, Southwest Marine Ecosystems report. So please, if you do have any information or think of things that crop up through the talks today, then uh, feel free to submit that and we can include it within the report when it's written. So we're going to uh, go around the region, starting with the Isles of Scilly, which I'll present on behalf of Vicky Heaney, and then moving into Cornwall, which Mark Grantham is going to present. Uh, I'll then cover Devon and uh, Ruth Porter is going to tell us about Straight Point in Exmouth and then we'll finish up with Dorset which I'm also covering for Richard Archer. So this is the Isles of Scilly part of the talk and Vicky works for the Isles of Scilly Wildlife Trust. She leads all the seabird monitoring uh, on the islands. Start off with Manx Shearwater. So in, in uh, similar fashion to the work that Paul presented, there was a rat eradication on two islands in, in uh, the Isles of Scilly, on St Agnes and Goo in 2013. And the numbers of Manx Shearwater subsequently nesting on the island have increased since that rat eradication programme 
uh, took place. You can see that numbers were really down as low as nine pairs in the later part of the, 20, of the 2000s and now rising up to about 82. So the breeding population has been increasing over time, uh, at least 82 pairs now. And there's also signs of expansion into new subcolonies within the Isles of Scilly. So an area in uh, Wingletang Down, for instance, where there's some grazing pressure, Manx shearwaters are now moving up the hill and, and nesting in the boulder fields. So there's definitely an increase in numbers and an expansion in areas that Manx shearwaters are using. The breeding success of the birds on the islands has also increased. So this shows the number of chicks. So these are stargazing chicks, chicks that are counted out on the slopes at night um, post fledging. There are at least 28 on St Agnes and 27 on Goo, so a total of 55 in, in 2021. And there were none recorded pre-rat eradication. So obviously the chicks are vulnerable uh, to, to rats when they're on the slopes. However, there was no fledging recorded at the subcolony on Briar or at Peninis on St Mary's where there are still rats. So several of the other islands do have Max Shearwaters trying to breed, but um, still suffering from rat predation. One of the other things that Vicky and the team have been doing is looking at the methods for monitoring uh, Manx shearwaters. So the, the way that we do it is to play uh, a call of, of shearwater into a burrow and listen for a response. And there have been some issues with switching to digital methods from, from tape methods, which were used previously. And Vicky and the team have found, um, well, they've studied 52 active burrows over five consecutive days in June last year for this response rate calibration. And they found that the factor that we use to, to correct the number of calls that are heard. So obviously you play a, a call, you listen for a response. Sometimes you don't hear a response, but there is one. Sometimes the bird doesn't respond. So there's a sort of correction factor applied. And they found that that, that is, is probably too low. And so the number of breeding pairs that we're estimating may actually be even higher still than, than the ones that we showed on that graph. On to uh, storm petrel, so European storm petrel breed, bred successfully again on St Agnes and Goo. Uh, the first records of the birds breeding there post rat eradication was 2015. Uh, this last year, a new area was also found to be supporting storm petrels on St Agnes uh, in, in boulders at Pedney Brow on Wingletang. There are some issues, although the rats have been eradicated, with continued cat predation. So this was first recorded in 2019. Um, and last year, a minimum of 17 adult birds were predated over three sites at Troy Town, uh, Burnt Island and Goo. However, 11 chicks were recorded calling, seven on Goo and four on St Agnes. So some chicks are being produced despite the uh, issues with cat predation there. There's a lesser blackback gull colony on Goo. Uh, last year was found to hold 397 pairs. So it's fairly stable. It's been at around 400 since 2012. So over the last 10 years, it's been stable. But previously in 2006, it was as, as great as 875 pairs. So it has declined over time, although now seems to be stable. You can see in the picture here on the left, uh, that's a drone. So drone surveys are increasingly being used for SIBO colony monitoring. And it was trialed on Goo and Samson last year for lesser backback girls, both for breeding pairs and for fledging chicks using a local contractor and the results are promising. These are some of the images from the drone surveys. So currently it's difficult to distinguish between the birds that are sitting on nests and are standing. So you can't always see uh, which birds are, are nesting and which are loafing. But next year, there's a new drone with uh, apparently seven, seven fold increase in magnitude of the imagery that it produces at the same height. So uh, that's, that gives us some hope that this would be a really useful method. One of the interesting things that Vicky and the team found is that the response to the drone differed between the colonies. So at Goo, where the drone was flying at 30 metres above the birds, there was no, no noticeable response. But uh, in contrast, at Samson, where the drone was as high as 80 metres, there was an apparent response from the gulls, and it's not clear why uh, we're getting those differences. Although there are some factors that we, we think are probably uh, contributing, so the angle of approach for the drone, for example, the noise that individual drones make, uh, as well as the height, can all have different effects. The drone was useful for the chick fledging records too, so obviously you don't have the problem that you have with the nest. If you see a chick, it is a chick unambiguously, and productivity from the colony seemed really high, so it ranged from about 0.94 to 0.88 chicks per pair, so certainly decent numbers of chicks being produced by the colony. 
Herring gulls uh, were monitored on a couple of sites. So one is on Sam Sampson, those are the dark blue bars on the graph, and the other is at Hugh Town and St Mary's. So these are roof nesting gulls within the town. You can see the red line shows the estimated productivity needed for colony stability. So the number of chicks that need to be produced to keep colonies going. Um, well below that line on Sampson in that, in that sort of natural nesting site, but usually above it in, in the uh, urban area. The productivity in Hewtown was up to 1.65 chicks per pair in 2021, but as low as 0.41 on Sampson. The, the drone work also was tried on Sampson for the herring gulls, and, and again, they did react to it. So like the Professor Blackback gulls did on Sampson. So there's a bit of, uh, um, a bit of further work needed to investigate uh, whether it is possible to use a drone without causing disturbance on that island in particular. Kitty Wake, um, a sort of sadly familiar story really across some of the smaller colonies in the southwest, although we haven't seen that at Lundy. You can see on Scilly that numbers of Kitty Wake have dwindled over time and last year for the first time in living memory there were no Kitty Wakes nesting uh, on the Isles of Scilly at all. So there was apparently brief interest on the east side of Goo, but um, that didn't turn into any nesting attempts. So it's, yeah, Kitty Wake's not doing well on the Isles of Scilly and indeed at many of the smaller colonies around the Southwest. This is the slide for Fulmer. So again, you can see the estimated productivity needed in red and in blue is the subcolony at Menowethan. And in, uh, sorry, in dark blue, that's Menowethan. In light blue, it's Daymark. Productivity was reasonable, so ranging from 0.4 to 0.54 chicks per year. You can see 2021 uh, looked like a good year in comparison with some of the other years that we've had this decade, particularly in the middle part of the decade. Common turn in, in, in um, similar fashion to Kitty Wake have declined over time on Scilly, so there have been sort of ups and downs over the years, but um, after a long period of no nesting between 2018 and 2021, there were some birds attempting and successfully nesting on uh, the south end of Annet in 2021. They were quite late, so they nested in mid to late June, and normally in the UK it's around about mid-May that turns nest, and possibly partially as a result of that, only three fledglings were recorded from those 18 pairs, that's just 0.17 chicks per pair. So it remains to be seen whether in 2022, we get any common terns nesting, and if so, uh, whether they return earlier. There's a, a wider uh, population monitoring effort on Annet in particular, and last year this recorded 45 puffins on the island. Uh, there were 50 in 2016, and 31 in 2015, 42 in 2019, so it's a relatively stable, smallish population of puffins there. The, the storm petrel area, which is in the southern uh, stud, southern beach on Annet, wasn't counted because of the presence of the terns and the uh, desire not to disturb them. But there were good numbers recorded at another study area on Annet. And Manxia waters were, were also surveyed within a sample area uh, where there were 29 apparently occupied burrows, and that's, that's relatively stable too. Similarly stable shag and great blackback gull numbers to 106 pairs of shag and 184 of great blackbacks. And both these species have recently been added to the special protection area on the Isles of Scilly. So it's encouraging that their numbers are uh, relatively stable. So in summary, uh, the burrow nesters on St Agnes and Goo, where the rats have been eradicated, continue to increase and spread in the areas that they're nesting in and that 55 stargazing chicks from Manxia water is a, is a record in recent times. Fulmers and herring gulls had a relatively productive season, uh, and, and as did the lesser blackbacks studied on goo. And interestingly, there were more oyster catchers recorded breeding there than in previous years. So there's around seven active nests just around Drop Nose Bay alone in mid-June. All of this suggests that uh, the effects of the rad, rad, eradication are starting to bear fruit. There's a Overall suggesting that 2021 was a relatively good food supply year for the birds nesting on the Isles of Scilly. And anecdotally, there were bait balls noticed off the islands and associated feeding flurries, very apparent through June and July. And also cetacean numbers seemed high. So it could be that good numbers of fish were bringing in cetaceans and enabling seabirds to have a relatively productive year. 
And on the on the downside, of course, uh, the number of kitty wakes was really disappointing. And although there there was some interest, they failed to breed, as I said. Um, and finally, with the terns coming back, although the first to settle in four years, it was late, and so you know productivity for them was not great. So ups and downs, as you'll see from some of the other sites that no doubt we'll hear about. Mark, are you there? Is your computer working? I know you've had some issues. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. I'll hand over. Back up running. <laughs> okay, great. I'll hand over to you for a uh, Cornwall update. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, for those who don't, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Mark Grantham, so um, chair of um, Cornwall Birds. Um, and what I want to chat to you about today is just a, uh, a very quick summary of uh, a few, some of the key sightings records of interesting species, uh, and then a quick summary of the breeding season, uh, and then just a bit of feedback from um, some of my own uh, projects, particularly on kittiwakes. Uh, so thank you to everyone that's provided any information uh, for anything I'm going to use here. So that's photographers, people sending in records, people doing nest monitoring, nest recording, webs counters for the BTO. It's a huge long list of people that contribute to uh, to what we can uh, what we can present here. So during 2021, the, over the two winter periods, so. Um, going systematically so the divers actually had quite a good year uh, in Cornwall so those counts of uh, of, of red-throated black-throated and great northern diver are all um, all notable uh, within the context of recent history uh, particularly red-throated diver and what's interesting is is that we'd expect numbers of these divers to be highest um, along the south coast um, east of Falmouth effectively but, but the, all these counts uh, the highest counts are all coming from Mounts Bay in 2021. So it's interesting that there's been that potential shift in numbers of birds into the into the shelter of Mounts Bay, uh, perhaps. Um, and we were graced again by our returning uh, Pacific diver, which was just the one uh, one of many rarity highlights of the year. I won't go into um, really to any of the, the rarity highlights of seabirds through the year because there's, there's a few too many and they're not they're not entirely all relevant. Um, so from divers which had a good year, um, one of the key species for, for Cornwall in the winter is, is black-necked grebe. Um, historically Cornwall's held the second largest wintering population behind Studland um, uh, but in recent years, that's really dropped off. And if you look at um, the, the, the counts from 2021, so just four birds in the key site of Carrick Roads, which is the, the mouth of the Fall Estuary. Uh, so just four birds there at the first winter period. And then actually no records at all from Carrick Roads into the second winter period. Um, the, the graphic I've, uh, I've shown here as well is just up to 2020. And I'm sure you can imagine that 2021, if you put the 2021 number on the bottom of that, it's just a, a quite a continued uh, and steep decline from, uh, from where we were even 10, uh, eight to 10 years ago. Um, and that does, I would say it mirrors the national trend, but it's probably partly driving the, the national trend as well. So if we look at the web's uh, trend for black neck grebe uh, in winter, then again, you can see peak around 28, 2010, uh, and then a slowly declining population. Uh, there's no obvious reason that we can see why those um, birds should be declining in Carrick Roads. You know, if anything, um, if anything, there's, there's less disturbance and better management now than there ever has been. So it's a bit unclear why they might be declining. Sea watching, uh, generally people just training, uh, training scopes out to sea. Uh, 2021, um, was a particularly poor year. So although yeah, we had lots of divers, um, the actual movements of uh, particularly shearwaters and big shearwaters are actually uh, quite limited really. And even of the rarities, just five records of Wilson's petrel and a single Fayers petrel. Um, there were things like little shearwater on, you know, on the rare side as well. Um, but some of the counts of things like Corries and Great Shearwater were both uh, quite low compared to, uh, compared to recent years. Uh, we continue to see big counts of Balearic shearwaters and um, 403 past Pendine. I'm sure Alex can probably correct me, but that's still going to be 
uh, notable in a regional uh, in a regional context. Uh, I can't think of many places that would have uh, higher counts than that, really. Uh, and for anyone that's wondering, the picture here is uh, uh, Corris Shearwater and a Manx Shearwater flying uh, flying side by side. A nice comparison of sizes there. So, I mean, Paul's um, and Alex have, uh, have both mentioned puffin. So, in Cornwall, puffin is something that really absolutely clings on at uh, one, perhaps two breeding sites. Um, it's quite a difficult species to monitor, and thanks to Padso. Uh, Padstow Sea Life Safaris, who um, provide daily records of puffins from their uh, from their boat trips um, out from Padstow. So up to 14 puffins were seen regularly throughout most of the early part of the season, um, peaking at yeah 25 in, in July. Proving breeding is always a bit more difficult for uh, for puffin without actually landing on the island, uh, which we don't do. Uh, but a, a single juvenile on the 3rd of July was, was possibly a returning bird from a, from a previous year, which is quite unusual. Uh, and then there was a single puffling um, seen on the island uh, on the 14th of August. But, but these, these birds are split between uh, the mools and gull and rock, uh, both of which are pretty, pretty safe and pretty inaccessible. Um, as far as we know, uh, they're rat free, but I don't think there's, unless Paul can correct me, I don't think there's necessarily uh, any evidence to, to, to show that. <clears throat> so going on to um, some of the breeding birds, so if we look at uh, the two main uh, seabird breeding islands away, away from orcs are Lou Island and Mullion Island. Uh, both of these are reasonably well covered uh, in servo work. So, Lou Island uh, had, again, um, reasonable counts this year, uh, COVID allowing people to go out and, and um, continue surveying after a bit of a gap in 2020. Um, cormorants did well, so 48 apparently occupied nests uh, of cormorant is actually the second highest count. Uh, and then again, good numbers of blackback, great blackback gulls, but um, there's still concern that the productivity of those great black, black gulls continues to decline. So you're talking just 0.4 um, chicks per pair in 2021. We'll talk about Mullion Island in a second, which is probably even worse. Um, but that producti productivity has been declining in great black, black gull, which is which is a worry. Uh, kind of a kind of a marine and coastal bird, but Canada goose also bred for the first time in. Uh, uh, 2021 on, on Blue Island. So Mullion Island, uh, the cormorant population is actually doing really well. So 73 uh, nests in 2021 was actually the highest that we've seen in, in the years that we've been doing it, which is since 2012. And as far as I can tell, from at least the previous 20 or 30 years before that. Um, and that's quite a significant increase from the 52 uh, pairs that we saw in 2020. Um, great blackback gulls, we didn't actually manage to get a nest count this year because we run a colouring project on cormorants. And basically there were there were so many cormorants um, at the start of the season that um, we only allow ourselves an allotted amount of time on Mullion Island to reduce disturbance. And we actually used up all of our time uh, colouring in cormorants rather than counting blackback gull nests. Um, but it appeared to be quite a successful breeding season on, on Mullion. So when we went back um, for a second visit later in the season, uh, there were at least 20, uh, 10, 10 medium sized, 10 large uh, great blackback gold chicks on the island. Which, again, if you think back to those productivity figures, then yeah, we'd be expecting anywhere between 55 and 65 great blackback gold nests. So productivity of between 15 and 20 chicks is still remarkably low. So on Mullion Island, we um, again, we're, we're colouring in great blackback gulls. Uh, and just one example here of one of these birds moving between sites. So we have LCN5, which is a chick that was ringed on Lou Island uh, in June 2016, that was seen variously around the lizard over the years, uh, and is now likely uh, to be a breeding bird on Mullion Island, seen on our visit in July 2021 showing uh, territorial behavior or, or defensive behavior. So again, there's obviously a bit of movement between these, uh, between these colonies. 
so coming on to Kitty Wakes, I know I know everyone's talked about the depressing story of Kitty Wakes, uh, and it's not that much different in Cornwall, really. Um, so this is the site at Porth Misson. So if we look back at Seabird 2000, there were 15 Kitty Wakes sites in Cornwall. Uh, we're now down to three, uh, which is, you know, a stark, massive decline. So this is Porth Misson uh, on the north coast. Um, due to COVID restrictions uh, upsetting someone's travel plans, uh, we didn't actually get a full survey this year, but we do know um, there were, again, a similar number, over 300 um, nesting birds on the 11th of June. And that, that's pretty, a slight decrease on, the, uh, on, on uh, 2020. Uh, but quite often we get better counts of kittiwakes later into the season. Uh, and again, you can see that you know, 360 nests in 2020 producing 135 chicks is, is not the productivity that we need to sustain a population. Uh, if you come down and look at um, Western Cove in Portreath, so <clears throat> upwards of uh, 550 birds counted at the colony in June, uh, with over 260 occupied nests, which is a similar count to previous years. Uh, of those, we managed to follow through the season 168 nests. Uh, they're mapped and numbered and we can follow them through the season. So of those, we had um, 54 fail, 47 successfully fledged young, and 67, and an unknown outcome, uh, which may or may not probably, again, split similarly failure and success. Um, and each of those are, are probably fledging between one and two chicks so again at, at a colony level we're, <laughs> we're aiming for probably 1.2 chicks per pair to maintain the population and again we're, we're well short of that uh, the the site that we um manage to visit probably most often is Trawalbus head uh which is two core sites and then a new site so the two core sites um one failed for the third year uh, in a row um, and then the second site, which historically has had uh, between um, 50 and 80 uh, pairs, held just nine occupied nests with 27 nests that were built and then uh, abandoned. Uh, those nine were reasonably successful, producing just over 15 chicks. Um, the, the newer site, Traqueen, <coughs> excuse me, had uh, just 15 uh, nests and again, 14 that were built. Uh, occupied and then abandoned partway through the season uh, and again that site fledged 20 chicks which again is reasonable productivity so a bit of a better picture at Trawalvis. Um, the, the new site is interesting so Traqueen is occupied by young birds and if we look at some of the birds that we've um, that we've colouring birds that we've seen there over the uh, over the summer in 2021 we've got birds that we've ringed at Trawalvis head in 2015, 16, and 18 and that kind of that's the typical age that birds are coming back to uh, to breed in the colony um excuse me and then we also have french ring birds that were a uh, ringless chicks in france in 27 2011 2015 so again these are again young birds that are moving around in this sort of wider population in the uh, in the english channel uh this is just one of them uh, and, and all of these birds, uh, I thought I'd better throw one picture of a colouring bird, but all of these birds have quite interesting uh, histories. So this is another one that was photographed um, out from um, uh, Portreath, I think it was, on a, uh, on a seal survey. And if you continue to zoom in, um, <clears throat> we can see this is a bird that we'd call yellow, white, yellow, orange, white, metal, uh, which is this bird. So. And um, this again is a, a French ring bird uh, ringed at the main colony at uh, Ponderas uh, in, in Finisterre in 2007, then promptly left, uh, never seen there again, and has done this tour as, as, a, as a young breeding bird, done a tour of breeding colonies. So seen at Porth Misson in 2014, not there since, uh, and then seen at Western Cove Portreath in 2018 and 2021 when it recruited uh, as, a, as a breeding bird. And we see that across quite a lot of colonies that we do share a lot of our um, a lot of our birds one way or the other uh, with these colonies in France. So uh, through the season, we saw six French ring kittiwakes at Portreath and six at Trawalvis Head. 
and we do actually see these the other way uh, as well. And, and this gives you an idea of how these birds move between colonies. So the top one is, is the most interesting. I won't read through all of these, but the top one <coughs> is the most interesting, which is uh, a bird that swings a chick on, um, on Gu in 1996. Uh, we re-caught it as, as an adult uh, in 2015 and, and fitted it with a unique colouring. Uh, and it's then been seen regularly at Trawarvis uh, from 2016, 2016 to 2020, um, before moving to uh, Pont de Vin in, uh, in France in 2020, and then moving to the nearby colony of Pont de Ras in uh, 2021. So that gives you an idea of a bird that might be from the cities, that these birds do have the ability to dot round and will breed at different, uh, different sites within, uh, within the matter population effectively. And you can see just here as well, we've got other birds from uh, other birds from Traqueenzorn um, and, and Trawarvis that have been seen in France as well. So four of our British ringed um, Trawarvis ringed birds were in France in 2021. So just to finish the kind of key areas, that I think we'd like to encourage more, more effort um, in, in the near future is to encourage more standardised recording through WEBS, the Wetland Bird Survey of, of the key estuarine sites. And I'm thinking, you know, to ensure that we have proper data to look at, um, at uh, wintry numbers of things like black neck reed, but also uh, you know, red breast and baganza and things like that. And these estuarine sites are really, really key because they, they are prone to disturbance, but have benefited recently with better uh, management of, of those disturbance pressures. Also, uh, a bit better monitoring of the of the breeding puffing numbers, you know, actually proving breeding, however that might be. Um, and then that also, there is some, um, some work underway at the moment that's looking at minimising the uh, possible tourism disturbance of those, uh, of those puffins on those breeding sites. Uh, but we'd also like to encourage, um, <clears throat> possibly through students, to have more take-up of nest recording for, for a lot of randomly spread whilst we can easily record a colony of kittiwakes it's harder to record individual and widespread nesting attempts of things like shag fulmer and herring gulls. so that's something we'd like to encourage um, and again um, that the kind of monitoring data and the productivity data that we have from uh, the kittiwakes at Portreet, it would be good to extend that wider for example to Porth Misson to get better coverage at sites like Porth Misson uh, and also to get a better handle on um, on productivity of both cormorants and blackback gulls on uh, on Mullion Island, uh, and then also there are this myriad, you know, storm petrels, a bit of a, a sort of mystery bird in Cornwall. Really, uh, you know, when you go and look, you can probably find them breeding on places like the Brisons um, off Cape Cornwall, but you know that kind of thing take takes a lot of effort and a lot of planning, and that would be something that might be quite useful um, in the near future. Right, that's all about me. So um, I'll have a look at the questions in a minute, but I'll uh, hand back to Alex. Thank you very much, Mark. Really interesting. Uh, okay, so moving up the region, we'll quickly cover Devon and then move through to Dorset. So what happened in Devon last year? So this is all about uh, breeding seabirds. I haven't got too much on uh, waders or anything like that, but in the report we can we can definitely include some of that information. So 2021 was the last year of the National Breeding Seabird Census and uh, there were a few sites left in Devon to mop up. So I managed to get a small grant through the Seabird Group to get a boat out of Plymouth uh, to cover this part of the South Devon coast. So this is Plymouth Sound and we're talking about the area from Plymouth Sound down to effectively Prawl Point and slightly beyond to Start Point. So I was joined on the boat by a couple of colleagues from Natural England, Richard Berridge and Sophie Allen, and we spent a day surveying this part of the coastline. And this is what we found. First place we went to was Great Mewstone. So this is an area uh, in Wembury Bay, obviously managed by the National Trust. It is possible to get access to the islands, but we didn't. We, we surveyed it solely from the boat. And you can see uh, from the comparison with the last time it was surveyed in 2007, how things looked. So we were there quite late in the season. So the numbers of cormorant we recorded, although we're pretty confident they are down on the 79 recorded in 2007, maybe it isn't quite as dire as this picture suggests. Um, it's better to go there probably in April or early May 
we were there in June. But nonetheless, the nests that we could see were definitely lower than they were in 2007. And it was a similar story for shag. Former, interestingly, had apparently increased by quite a bit. So from seven nests, apparently occupied sites up to 22, whereas herring gull had declined, uh, as had great blackback gull. Some of these are pretty consistent with the national picture, particularly the declines in shag and herring gull. And some of them are a bit more interesting, so we don't know why there may be more fulmar on Great Moostone now than there was uh, 15 years ago. The next stretch is Nos Mayo to Erm Estuary, so it's typified by these sort of low cliffs and sandy coves. It's not great seabird breeding habitat, but uh, there are some breeding there. In 2007, again, there were cormorants. We didn't see any cormorant nests at all, but we did see seven shag nests, four fulmar nests, 17 herring gull nests, so relatively stable in this part of the coast, although no great flatback gulls. The next bit along is Bigbury Bay, so that starts with Berg Island, obviously uh, famously encapsulated in stories by Agatha Christie and joined by this sand spit at low tide to the mainland. Most of the birds nest around the kind of back of the island away from the inhabited bit where the hotel is. Similar story, no cormorants. Uh, we, as I said, we weren't there at the ideal time, but there was no evidence of, of nests and cormorant nests can be quite obvious. Similarly, uh, very few shag nests, only, only the one compared to seven back in 2000. Fulmer's pretty stable again, herring gulls 50% decline, and uh, great blackback gulls uh, had declined, but obviously not from a very, a very large number of nests in the first place. Continuing the pattern uh, in, the, in the last bit, so uh, along to start point from Sulcombe, the numbers of herring gulls had declined by about 80%. So originally there were 142 nests here in 2000, only 22 when we went. So the, all along this stretch of coast, effectively herring gull numbers have plummeted over the course of the last 20 years or so. Likewise, as I said earlier, uh, shag numbers were really down, so we didn't find any shag nests along this bit of coast where previously there had been 11. So it was a uh, slightly depressing day out on the water, seeing all of these stretches of coast which formerly would have been occupied now very, very thinly populated. Um, and it remains to be seen how this fits with the wider national trends which will be coming out later this year, published by JNCC when they analyze the full results from the census. But we think it's probably typical of what's been happening in Devon, particularly these declines in herring gull and shag. Uh, Paul, Paul gave us a really great talk about Lundy, so I won't dwell too much on, on the results from Lundy, certainly not the uh, abundance figures, but the productivity monitoring continued on Lundy, and that, that's quite interesting. So former productivity, round about just under half a chick per pair. This is the national average at the, at the bottom here. So this isn't the number needed to maintain the colony, but it does give us an idea of how sites in Devon are comparing with sites across the country. So it's, you know, round about the national average, but still not great. Former productivity, similar to the national average again. Uh, puffin productivity on Lundy last year almost matched the national average. And then the kind of familiar story we've been hearing about Kitty Wakes, not only um, well, actually, numbers of kitty wakes relatively stable on Lundy, but uh, productivity really down. So only 0.18 to 0.24 chicks per pair, way below the national average and way below the figure needed to sustain the colony into the long term. These are a couple of the other sites regularly monitored in Devon. So on the left here, we've got Berry Head. This is uh, the town of Brixham at the top of the, the photo there. So this is at the bottom end of Tor Bay. Uh, we haven't got any data from that site yet for guillemots, which it, it supports a decent colony of guillemots, but there were about 30 apparently occupied nests for Kitty Wake. Um, so there's a really small colony clinging on there. Like Mark said, I think we've now got four Kitty Wake colonies left in Devon, where previously we would have had about 15 about 20 years ago. Uh, and this is one of them, although it's, you know, it's really small and, and clinging on. There's another Kitty Wake, uh, sorry, another Guillemot colony in Tor Bay. So this is the Ore Stone. You can see the, the uh, larger of these rocks just off the coast of Torquay, which you can monitor from the land. And a good population of Guillemots there, around about 300, which, is, which has been pretty stable over the last few years. The Guillemots are doing okay. Kitty Wake's definitely not. Just a word on urban gulls. So a lot of the survey effort for the census has focused around urban gulls and trying to get estimates, particularly for herring gull and lesser blackback gull from 
these birds which obviously increasingly nest in our towns and cities. So we had 25 more one kilometre squares that visited in 2021 and thanks to all the volunteers that, that took part in that. Uh, we've got really good coverage now from places like Brixham, Exeter, Exmouth, Plymouth, Tynmouth and JNCC have now been able to use some of the results from the work that we've done and from other, uh, other work to put together some estimates of urban gulls nesting in England for the first time comprehensively ever. Uh, and that's available on the internet if you're interested to find it. But I think as part of the National Seabird Census, we will have regional estimates as well. But for now, uh, we've got them at England level. And that's that's testament to all of the people who've gone out and walked around their towns and counted the gulls on the reef. We have a sort of correction factor, which is generated from aerial surveys that have taken place at the same time as the ground based surveys. And the idea is that we'll keep visiting some of these one kilometer squares into the future so that we can track urban gull trends over time. Right, Ruth, are you there? I think the next slide is about straight point. Hi, Ruth. Yeah, hi. Just let me know when you want me to move on. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Ruth Porter. Um, I monitor a kitty bait colony in Exmouth in East Devon. Um, and Alex also helps me with that. Um, so I was just going to give a quick update on uh, last year's results from there. Um, Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just a summary slide here, which shows um, the apparently occupied nest counts um, over the past sort of 21 years. Um, and you can see there that um, in 2021, we had 231 apparently occupied nests. Um, the colony actually goes around the corner from uh, this cliff face in the picture. Um, this is the face that we do the breeding success uh, monitoring on. Um, but um, so um, it was uh, looking quite promising on the 7th of June in uh, last year, uh, 231 nests. Um, and in 2020, uh, we were also quite up on previous figures, uh, 251. Uh, in the bottom of the slide, um, you can see a summary of the breeding success figures from the last four years. So um, I start, uh, Alex and I started um, sort of regularly monitoring the breeding success at this site in 2018. Um, the first couple of years were really good, um, you know, really positive compared to national um, breeding success figures. Uh, then in 2020, um, something started going wrong and um, the figures weren't looking very good. Um, and then last year, I um, was hoping it might revert, but it didn't. Um, and you can see from that table that um, we have three plots that we monitor. Um, plot one almost had complete failure, um, 0.1 chicks per pair. Uh, plot two, again, almost complete failure of 0.2 um, chicks per pair, but plot three um, seems to be holding up, so um, one chick per pair there. So overall, um, the figure was 0.43 chicks per pair for the for the area that we monitor. Um, that was 137 apparently occupied nests out of that um, total figure of 231 in the colony. So um, if you can move on, yeah, so I... Um, I wanted to kind of visually plot out um, what's happening with the nest for me to sort of try and understand what's happening within the colony. Um, so I've put four slides together here, which just kind of give a, yeah, like an overview. Um, so the green dots, obviously, um, they represent successful chick fledging, um, red dots, uh, nest failures, and then the yellow dots, uh, trace nests. Um, so overall, you know, 2018 looked pretty good. And then if you flick on Alex through the next couple, um, 2019, say the black dots that come in there are, are, are nests that were occupied the previous year and then not in the, in the current year. Um, and then on to 2020, where you then start to see a lot of uh, the red nest failures. Um, and then 2021, um, a lot of black and red. Um, I will say that um, looking back through um, photos that I took, um, I took a photo at the end of May, the 25th of May, when I just sort of visited to see what, what was going on. Um, and also when Alex and I went and did the count on the 7th of June, um, I have seen actually looking back at those photos that a lot of these black dots, there were birds on those nests. Um, so this, this was kind of the picture from when I first started the breeding success uh, monitoring. So, um, Basically, they were nest failures, a lot of them probably, um, so the birds might well have been there. Um, so, yeah, overall, um, 
2021 was not a good year at all, um, despite the fact it looked promising. Um, Alex, I don't know if you want to just flick on to the next. Um, next oh they've gone all a bit distorted <laughs> um these faces have gone a bit strange but um yeah um crossing fingers for 2022 that um that we see more chicks rather than the photos on the right which are the poor um adults looking down at emptiness um i i don't know what's happening at the site um as i say like plot three seems to be doing quite well it had three nests of three checks which is quite um encouraging normally um so yeah, um, keep the monitoring going and see see what happens in the in the years to come. Thanks. Thank Alex. you, Ruth. No, thank you. That's great. Well, not great, is it? Bad, not great. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for presenting. Okay, great. That that brings us to the end of Devon, and I've got a few slides just to cover Dorset to finish this up. So these are prepared by Richard Archer from the RSPB. Unfortunately, Richard can't be with us today, so. Um, I'm going to present these for him. So this, these cover the main breeding sites in Dorset, uh, starting with Brown Sea, obviously in Pool Harbour. So Dorset Wildlife Trust reported really low numbers of sandwich terns in 2021 compared to most years. Um, there were 57 terns breeding, uh, but they only produced 40 fledglings. So that's about 0.76 chicks per pair. And there was quite a lot of great blackback gull issues at the colony in 2021. So that may have discouraged some birds from breeding, but also may contribute to some of the uh, lower productivity. This, this colony is usually quite productive. Common tern, there are about 174 pairs of common terns. So that's pretty good, but they only produce 60, 76 fledglings, which is only 0.4 chicks per pair. So, you know, below national average and, and below the level needed to sustain the colony. And again, that's thought to be as a direct result of the great blackback gull predation that, that happened at the site last summer. In contrast, black-headed gulls didn't suffer the same sort of issues of predation. There were 193 pairs of black-headed gulls and they managed to produce 176 fledglings. So that's 0.9 chicks per pair, which is pretty good. Uh, the great blackbacks themselves did all right. So 11, 11 apparently occupied nests and they managed to get 19 fledglings off, which is 1.7 chicks per pair. So a good year for great blackbacks, but not a good year for uh, terns at that site. The next, uh, the next site is uh, some gull islands off Halton. So this is, again is in Pool Harbour. Um, I think previously Richard had reported these as being from Giggers Island, but but they're not. They're, they're separate islands, and they were visited for the first time properly since 2018. Uh, that's a team led by Birds of Pool Harbour including Paul Morton, and they found 109 uh, apparently occupied nests of Mediterranean gulls, whereas previously there were 155 in 2018, 3,706 black-headed gulls, where previously there were 4,415. So it's not clear why those numbers have dropped. Uh, it, it's possible that there may be other islands that are supporting breeding gulls. You really need something sort of coordinated and comprehensive to be able to track that, but it's clear that there are some changes at least over the short term at that site. A couple of freshwater sites on the Dorset coast. So we've got Lodmore, which is just outside Weymouth. Last year that held 50 apparently occupied nests for common tern, and they managed to produce 80 young. So that's really excellent productivity, 1.6 chicks per pair compared with the 0.4 that we saw at Brown Sea Island. No black-headed gull figures there, but at the other end of the Fleet Lagoon, we've got Abbotsbury. Uh, and there were black-headed gulls there, so 25 apparently occupied nests, and they fledged about 50 chicks, so two chicks per pair from that site for black-headed gulls. So really good productivity for black-headed gulls in that area last year. Uh, common terns at Abbotsbury, about 25 apparently occupied nests, and still decent productivity, so uh, 0.8 chicks per pair there. Then in the middle of those two sites, we've got uh, Chesil Beach, as I'm sure everybody on the call will know, there's a little tern colony at Chesil Beach, which has been the subject of uh, a lot of hard work from RSPB and partners over the years to try and turn it around. It, it was uh, getting close to vanishing at one point, and now uh, we're up to 48 apparently occupied nests, which is fantastic. But the birds did not have a good year in 2021. So there were 70, uh, sorry, 65 nesting attempts made, 155 eggs, which is all looking good, 102 chicks hatched again, not bad at all, but only three of those uh, birds survived to fledging. And that was nearly all attributable to kestrel predation that happened in the area. 
And there have been issues of kestrel predation at that colony before, and it's required quite intensive management in terms of trying to supplementary feed the kestrels to divert them away from the little terns. But um, in 2021, whatever me measures were in place were not successful. And the kestrels also uh, predated the ringed plover chicks. So there were eight pairs of ringed plovers only producing two fledglings. So it just goes to show even with all the efforts that the RSPB and the volunteers at that site and all the people involved in trying to keep the colony going, uh, it, it really is an uphill battle for some of these fragile seabird populations that we have around our coasts. Finally, uh, just a word on the colour ringing scheme that, um, that operates across the UK and Ireland. Uh, some sightings at Chesil Beach last year. So this adult IX2 was ringed as a chick uh, at Portain in Ireland in 2018, and it was captured here at Chesil June last year. So there's a lot of interchange between the Irish colonies and the British ones, and uh, that's quite an interesting finding that, that there was one at Chesil. Some of them don't move so far. So this, this individual was ringed as a chick at Chesil in 2017, and here it is breeding again at the same site. And that brings us to the end of the regional roundup. So thank you very much for, for listening. I hope you found it interesting. As I said at the beginning, I will be compiling or editing the report for the Southwest Marine Ecosystems birds chapter. If you have any observations or insights from the 2021 season that you'd like us to consider within the report, then you can send them to me at this email address here. And I think uh, Bob Burr will also be sending out uh, some information about the report in due course. So there's plenty of opportunity to feed in anything that you, uh, you might like us to include. Thanks again for listening. And uh, Keith, I'll hand back to you to see if there's any questions on the presentations that we've heard. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Alex and uh, all the other presenters. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, put your fat, put your thumb up if it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got a few questions. Uh, carrying on from where well, we've answered the um, question from Francis, I think, uh, from Chris Binney, who reports on North Devon and West Somerset? Would anyone like to comment on that? Yeah, I can say I can say a bit on that, Keith. So um, we don't have a lot of reporting, at least for seabird breeding, from those sites. Mainly, I think, because they're quite difficult to access. So we've got some really good colonies like at Woody Bay, um, but you need to really to get out on a boat to survey them. So if someone's keen to do it, then we'd love to receive more data. As it is, we only manage to do it about once every 10 years when we can get money to get vessels out and things like that. So, yeah, we're really keen to have any sort of increase in monitoring of that area that we can. OK, that's good. And Bob Earl asked about per peregrine predation. Was it an is issue in 2021? I think that might be related to my um, talk because um, last year when 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 the um, productivity went downhill, um, we had seen peregrines around. And again, we did see some this year. There's been no direct um, evidence of, of any sort of peregrine predation. It's just that we've seen them in the area. Um, and then, but also actually when Alex and I were down at the plot um, on one visit, there was also great black back gull go, going in. So um, we don't know um, whether it's predation or other factors like without, you know, without the um, direct evidence. But it feels a bit like it might be predation to me, <laughs> but that's just a um, feeling. Um, Most of our failures at, uh, at, at, um, at our Kitty Wake sites are either raven at the early egg stage or um, Okay. Or peregrine at the chick stage. Okay, this was definitely at the egg stage. So, um, yeah. Um, and yeah, I see there's another question about, um, yeah, what's different about plot three? I, I really don't know. And, and uh, but it's it's the um, the results from those three different plots and the fact that plot three still seems to be doing quite well um, and has nest with three chicks in that makes me feel like it might be some sort of predation going on um, because the fact that the other sort of part of the colony that we monitor is just almost completely wiped out um so but i but i really don't know like we don't have the evidence for it so it's hard to know okay uh, thanks for that i think that's answered all the questions and the q a in the q a and the uh, chat is being answered as it goes along tell me if you've missed anything but otherwise um i'm going to uh, basically um round up now uh any uh, any more comments from the panelists? Anything you want to say that you forgot to say previously? 
Just to add one thing, um, Keith, to a question Bob asked about goal decline linked to discards. I see Mark's answered that. Yeah, I, I agree with what Mark's put, but I would also encourage you, Bob, to have a look at the JNCC report on urban girl estimates, because that might answer some of your question. Although we've seen these pretty drastic declines in, in rural and coastal populations, if you look at the urban populations there, you know, they're, the numbers have to be seen to be believed, to be honest. Okay, I will round up now and say, Thank you very much indeed to all of the panelists who've worked hard to pull together data and information uh, to inform the Southwest Marine Ecosystems report for 2021, but also the state of, of Southwest Seas. And I will certainly be using some of that information in an interesting presentation I have to give on where Devon's seas will be in 2050. Um, so do keep section editors informed about what you observe in 2022 now, as well as anything you've got for 2021. Uh, and yes, Bob might not have been online when I said that he would very soon uh, send out a list of the uh, all of the different editors and their email addresses so that you can communicate them with, uh, with them properly. And uh, just as a final uh, point, um, if I can actually share my screen properly, which doesn't seem to have happened. Um, yeah, you're sharing. I am sharing. I've got no green line around it. But finally, thank you very much indeed to the Marine Biological Association for uh, hosting uh, this webinar and uh, three more uh, to come in the next uh, a week or so. Um, this is very useful. It's been a very interesting learning exercise to, for me. And I'm sorry about any glitches which... Um, which you experienced during the presentation. Uh, so thank you very much indeed, everyone, and do watch the upcoming uh, webinars as well. Uh, and with that, I'll shut down if I can.